This episode of New Politics was released on the 25th of February, 2023, and produced on the land of the Wangal and Wajak people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, is it time to investigate the Australian Federal Police? More resignations from the New South Wales Government? And is the honeymoon really over for Anthony Albanese? We'll see what 116 coal seam gas wells have to say about that. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, the master of disaster. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription, but whether it's a subscription or whether you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a T-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. The Australian Federal Police is in the news again and this time it's through an interview with the former Defence Minister, Senator Linda Reynolds and that was published in the Weekend Australian newspaper last weekend and this relates to the allegations of a rape that occurred in Parliament House in 2019, just a few weeks before the federal election was announced. It's not often that a person who helped cover up a crime scene at the time reappears almost four years later and tries to make out that they are the victim, more so than the actual victim. But that's exactly what Linda Reynolds is trying to do here. And as bad as all of this is, this is not the real issue. But the publication of the personal diaries of Brittany Higgins, which were provided to police as part of the case against Bruce Lerman, well, that's where the problem lies. Somehow, these personal diaries were provided to News Corporation and formed a large part of the story about Linda Reynolds. They were provided to the Federal Police to help with the investigation, but weren't actually tendered to the court. So they're not public documents, but here they are being published in a News Corporation newspaper. There is currently an ACT government investigation into the behaviour of the police in the investigation and trial of Bruce Lerman, and that was a trial that was aborted, but the leaking of this private material to News Corporation is another issue that needs to be investigated as well, and the role of the Australian Federal Police. Disgraceful and disgusting, and all the usual words we use don't really cover how appalling it is. It's an organisation that was caught out tapping into a dead girl's phone to retrieve any voice messages they were there that has continually gone through people's private stuff for dirt. It is an organisation that runs campaigns against people that threatens the establishment. I think all of this is public record. I don't think I'm saying anything that our listeners don't know. But this is particularly vile as private diaries published without permission is just wrong. Now, if, had they been presented to the court as evidence and a newspaper, even a News Corp one, had said, we believe this is in the public interest to show the full details of the case, okay, that's fine. But this was done without her permission, without her knowledge. And then there was a, a snarky headline the next day with a picture of her sitting in the park saying how furious she was. Again, this is nobody's business. I note that the alleged perpetrator isn't getting this type of detail and this type of attention. Now, I'll be fair, he shouldn't be. Neither should Brittany Higgins, obviously, till the matter is resolved. And there's a civil court hearing to come. Till the matter is resolved, all sides should be kept out of the news except when it's genuinely in the public interest. And private documents, private messages, private time sitting in a park is not in the public interest. Whoever okayed this should be ashamed of themselves. But of course, we know they're not because these people are incapable of normal human emotions like shame and empathy and wisdom and insight and even ethics. And we've discussed the issue of the Australian Federal Police in previous episodes of New Politics, and I think it's an institution that needs to be investigated further. Now, generally, I believe that the Federal Police couldn't care less about Bruce Lerman. He's just a political bit player in all of this. But if a crime has been committed, someone needs to be held accountable on this. But it seems to me that they're protecting someone else. Now, The Federal Police, they stonewalled on the actual investigation. They stonewalled on releasing the CCTV footage from the night of the crime. They pretty much stonewalled on everything. And then there was the issue with the jury where somehow research material was left behind and miraculously found in the jury room. And 
That was the information that led to the mistrial of the case against Bruce Lerman. Now, there is a new theory floating around, and that is that this incident was a two-person crime, and there's not just the one culprit, but two. There is that allegation against Bruce Lerman, who was seen hurriedly leaving Parliament House on the night of the crime. The other culprit is another unknown person within the building. And all of this might be within the realms of conspiracy theories and all that sort of stuff, but these ideas float around when there's a poor handling of a police case. And hopefully the investigation into this case will find out some more tangible details. Innocent people don't destroy evidence. Innocent people don't have their bosses cover up for them. He's claiming that he went through and checked that she was okay and then left her there, which was disgusting and disgraceful and abhorrent behaviour. If someone has been put through that type of thing, you help. You call the police, you call an ambulance, you make sure that they're okay and you wait till the police and ambulance come. You give a full and frank statement and you set the wheels of justice moving. Then they came in, they wiped the security tapes, they cleaned the area of all biological and physical evidence, steam cleaning the carpets. They don't call a crime scene. The police are called after all this. There's clearly something bigger going on here, whether it's just trying to protect the party itself, which of course has a terrible reputation with women, whether there was somebody else involved. It's just an awful situation for all involved. And the federal police really should have stepped up a lot harder. But of course, the federal police have always been, and I think I've said this before here, they were set up because the Victorian police wouldn't protect Billy Hughes. Someone threw an egg at him at a meeting in Victoria and the Victorian police refused to deal with it. So he he put together the Australian federal police. So there's always been that element of the federal police aren't there primarily to uphold federal laws, but they're there to protect the office of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. So it needs a total reform of the system, probably a clean out of all its senior members and to start over. Well, I guess the way that it was set up, that's partially the the issue. And the Australian Federal Police, initially they were known as the Commonwealth Police, and I think that's an institution that has been politicised and maybe it was seen as a private police force or a militia to protect the Prime Minister of the day. That that goes all the way back to 1917. But over the past 50 years or so, I think it's become a lot closer to the political and ideological thinking of conservative political parties, and especially after 1996. We had those raids on the ABC in 2019 and on journalists and the use of the federal police to raid the offices of Labor Party senators in 2016, union officers as well. The AFP was called in to find out who leaked information against the government on the NBN project. And then there were all those terrorist raids whenever the coalition government was in political trouble and would only find out later on that there were no charges ever laid. Now, All of this might have been legitimate police work that was going on to find out whether there were any illegalities or anything untoward going on, but those coalition governments at the time, they're always keen to magnify those issues, leaking to the media about upcoming raids and maximising the damage to their political opponents. So I don't think that's a correct use of the Australian Federal Police, and perhaps the AFP does need to be investigated as well. Perhaps they need to be reformed, as you suggested, or they have to do things in a different way. The Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, he's the one that's got responsibility for the Australian Federal Police, so maybe that's another issue that he'll have to look into as well. The Federal Police need to be, it needs a total restructure, it needs a total rethink of its purpose. It needs to be cleaned out. Tony Abbott, of course, stayed with the Federal Police when he first moved to Canberra, which wasn't a good look. It didn't show the police with the distance that they need to have. Good police work is apolitical. Now, of course, a lot of police have a more conservative view of how society works. And so they've joined the police force in part to protect the institution of the law and to uphold the law, which tends to suggest a more conservative outlook. Not always, of course, but senior police officers tend to be more on the right side of things. Surprises and disappoints some, although it shouldn't. It it makes sense when you think it through. However, good police officers, like good public servants, know that everybody deserves the same protection under the law. Everybody deserves the same rights, the same privileges, the same treatment under the law. Because human nature being what it is, that's a a whole other thing. But 
you shouldn't have such a perceived imbalance towards how the police treat one side over the other. This is why we need a complete clean out. And we started off this section by talking about the role of the media and News Corporation as well. And, you know, there's also Linda Reynolds. Not sure why she's decided to bring this issue up now. But as part of the story, the private diaries of Brittany Higgins were revealed and published in the week in Australia. And this was material that was presented by Brittany Higgins to the Australian Federal Police, as we mentioned before. And the material was only leaked to News Corporation and nowhere else. And just for your information, the media and public relations manager at the Australian Federal Police... Renee Valaris. She used to be a journalist and a political reporter for the Korea Mail in Queensland, and that's a news corporation newspaper. Now, I'm not suggesting anything at all here, David. I'm just making that link between the Australian Federal Police and News Corporation. But I think all of this has got the stench of that British News of the World scandal that ultimately led to the Leveson inquiry in 2011. And in my opinion, Rupert Murdoch should have been sent to jail for his actions and stripped of his media licenses in the UK for not being a fit and proper person to hold a media license. Now, Rupert Murdoch might be coming up to 92 years of age, but he's not a fit and proper person to hold a media license in Australia either. And we've said this before, David, but News Corporation is a worldwide media and propaganda machine for the Conservative Party in the UK, the Republican Party in the United States and the Liberal Party in Australia. And I don't think there's anything too controversial about saying that. It's pretty close to the truth. But this is a prime example of how News Corporation operates and how it behaves. It's like a mafia unit that just attacks its enemies through its journalism hit squads and even publishing private diaries of a victim in a rape case. Now, we know that News Corporation has no limits when it comes to poor taste and illegal behaviour, so they should be investigated here as well. Yeah, it will be interesting. I wonder if Labor has the will to do so. Each time they have the opportunity to curtail the negative influence of News Corp, they don't. Politicians love good press. And, of course, to put in a media outlet under investigation worries libertarians <laughs> or anyone with a libertarian bent because you know okay news corp yeah they're bad boo what about the guardian for balance we better get rid of the ones on the left boo and fairfax boo and channel nine boo now to be fair if, if we lost all of those i wouldn't be that great a net loss to australia but you do want a free press you do want a press that is critical but there's a difference between being critical and being biased now we're all biased of course but news corp's bias seems to transcend the law and that's got to change so there are ways of setting it up so that the government can be seen to be not taking an axe to the whole institution of the media in australia It seems that they'd rather have the status quo. And, of course, they bend over backwards to help News Corp and then News Corp just hammers them at the next election anyway. So I don't know what's in it for them. And if it was fair hammering, you'd say, okay, but it's just continual unfair misrepresentation. It's the unethical behaviour, really. It's not that they are biased to the right. That's fine. They're a private firm. They're allowed to have their own political views and they're allowed to push their own political view. That's part of free speech. And free speech is not being able to say whatever you want. Free speech is being able to criticise governments. It's more the illegal and unethical behaviour of some of their editors and journalists, like publishing private diaries that are not in the public domain, that is problematic. And this is where they've probably outlived their usefulness as a public service. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Dirty 
There is an election coming up in New South Wales next month and we'll be reporting more on this as time gets closer and there has been a raft of resignations in recent times. The New South Wales Finance Minister, Damien Tudorhope, he resigned after he failed to disclose shareholdings in Transurban. Liberal Party MP Peter Poulos, he has resigned as Parliamentary Secretary in a bizarre revenge porn episode from five years ago. And this follows on from other resignations over the past year or two, Gladys Berejiklian as well, and there's other ministers who won't be contesting at the next election. This, for me, is the sorry sight of politics in New South Wales, and it doesn't really matter who's in office, corruption and mismanagement is always close by and this really has got the feeling of the last days of a dying government in New South Wales. Sometimes a political culture develops in a particular region or an area. New South Wales was founded as an illegal settlement all the way back in 1788. There was a rum corps that ran for about 30 years or so and once that political culture becomes established it's very hard to shake it off even after 230 years or thereabouts. So There is likely to be a new government in New South Wales at the end of March, but the biggest challenge will be whether a new government can change the business-as-usual approach in New South Wales and change that usual business of corruption and mismanagement. In one of his books, Bob Bottom opens with a quote that basically says, We all know that New Jersey is the most corrupt city in the world, provided you ignore Brisbane, and Brisbane is provided you ignore Sydney. (laughs) How true that is, I will leave to our good residents in Queensland and our good residents in New South Wales to argue out. But certainly there's no doubt that uh, New South Wales has had a stain of corruption run through it since 1788. Before then, things ran perfectly well, I must say. Something happens in 1788 and the whole thing changes. I'll have to research that. (laughs) Premiers are picked not through cabinet who is selected through the uh, the process of democratic election. The premiers are picked from outside and there are all kinds of influences and people who maybe shouldn't have a say deciding who becomes premier. This is how Dominic Perrette becomes leader of what is ostensibly a moderate New South Wales government. This is how somebody like Brad Hazard remains as health minister despite every week proving that he is not fit for the job. And one of the great injustices is that he gets to resign or not run again for office when he should be hounded out of office and then hounded out of the state, as should Dominic Perrottet, let's be fair, as should really all of them. But the other side isn't much better. The other side had the chance to move forward under a young female leader, but mining interests, gambling interests stepped in, she is removed and Chris Minns is put in, who, despite the fact he says good things every now and then, is really more of the same. Now in New South Wales, we've got to get rid of the Perite stain. It's been a disaster. We're three years into a pandemic that should have lasted 18 months to two years under good management. Perite was right behind the bad management of that, refusing to let cabinet sanction further lockdowns, refusing to help people, having different levels of lockdowns. Instead of locking down the eastern suburbs for a week, they had to lock down the western suburbs for months with helicopters, with curfews, because they couldn't bring themselves to do the right thing in their own seats. It's a disgraceful, corrupt government. Every week there's another scandal. I am 99% sure that there will be a new premier in March. But the only reason I worry is that in the last election, there were 10 ex-liberal members on the crossbench who had left the party because they were in front of ICAC. And that should have been enough to see the Berejiklian government consigned to the dustbin. Again, they have a very soft media, a media that doesn't even give a positive spin, just doesn't report stuff. That type of story gets put on page eight and page nine, just after the opinion pages. He didn't mention the disaster that is childcare in New South Wales. There's not enough places. The places that there are are too expensive. The underfunding of schools. And now this is mostly federal, but the states uh, support it. Money being poured into the private school system where the public school system is left to squander. The other thing too is that the party is in disarray. It's the party eating itself apart. They're a bunch of jackals tearing into each other. And it's the same thing with every scandal. Everything's been leaked by someone within the party. The photograph of Perrette in his Nazi uniform came from someone within the party, someone who is likely at the party, ultimately. I said last week that this is the last of the neoliberal, hard-right, dry, call them what you will, 
governments in Australia and the death rattles are seismic. I can't really see how he can win. And I think that it won't be a Labor majority as such. It will be like federally and then a whole lot of independents. Looking at the seats in Sydney that have independents federally and that strong independents are running for at a state level, I think there's a lot of networking going on for post-political jobs because the notion of a safe seat, at least for the Liberal Party, at least for now, has gone. So we're really laying the boots into the New South Wales government here. But aside from all of those problems that you just mentioned, everything's going very, very, very well. Uh, But politics does tend to run through cycles. And for me, there just seems to be this natural cycle where a government runs out of steam after one or two terms. And being in government, it's very hard work. There's no question about that. The New South Wales government has probably been in office for one term too many, but these things are never automatic. No one's going to give up office if they keep winning elections and the opposition isn't good enough to defeat them. The New South Wales Liberal Party, they've been in government for 12 years and I think initially there was some relief after the terrible final years of the previous New South Wales Labor government, which ended in 2011. But now we're seeing exactly the same sort of behaviours, where a government just isn't interested in governing anymore. And there's still a wide range of internal battles within the New South Wales Liberal Party. Scott Morrison had to come in during the week and override a selection of a moderate candidate. And if you're getting these sorts of disasters or disastrous issues four weeks out from an election day, well, it probably means that things are not looking very good for that party. And in general, state politics is mainly based around who's best positioned to provide services and facilities to the public. And that's schools, hospitals, roads, transport, power supplies, planning for the future. The public generally, they're not too interested in who is a moderate or who's part of the extreme right or left or whatever. They're mainly interested in who will provide these services in the best possible way. And there's a perception that the New South Wales government just isn't doing that at the moment. They're more interested in themselves. And once those perceptions are set, it's very hard to turn them around, especially if there's an election in four weeks' time. As I said, I can't see that they'll win. There is, there is a slight chance that they might scrape through. I think it's showing that the Liberal Party itself needs to have a really good look at itself and how it becomes a party that represents mainstream Australian values again, and that could be the theme of the last three weeks. And how you avoid putting in inappropriate people like Dominic Perrottet, like Scott Morrison, like on and on and on and on. I would also, David, you mentioned that relationship with the federal election from last year, and it's it's a very similar sort of situation. The Liberal National Coalition in New South Wales, they're actually already in a minority position. Mm. Labor needs to win nine seats to achieve a majority government. Last year in the federal election, they needed eight seats. And achieving nine or winning nine additional seats will be very difficult to achieve in New South Wales. But a lot of this seems to be a mini version of the federal election from... 2022. Labor is currently way ahead in state opinion polling, 56% to 44% in two-party preferred voting. Need to pick up a similar amount of seats to form governments. There's also those threats to Liberal-held seats in the North Shore from independent candidates. And as you suggested before, it might end up being a very similar result, a slim Labor victory, large independent crossbench, and Liberals losing a lot of seats in areas that they shouldn't be losing their seats in. Federally, the Liberal Party don't have a seat in sight of Sydney Harbour, which is amazing. It's incredibly impossible that you'd ever think that could happen. I think the same thing's going to happen at a state level. This is where, too, parties like the Greens might slip through. Parties like the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers might come through. But I get the sense that minor parties, as great as they are, minor parties aren't getting the traction. Whether there's a feeling in the electorate that the party system's done, that they won't trust party people till they know that the party is good, or whether that the independents running are just so strong that the minor parties have to really step up their policy game, their candidate game, their communications game. There's opportunities there for parties. 
course, Simon Holmes Accord is funding some of the independents. It's a fairly large budget to deal with. He's picking people who he thinks will be best for Australia. He doesn't agree with them as such. And once they're elected, he's no longer part of the process, according to all involved. It's going to be an interesting thing. But yeah, I suspect we'll go into a minority government in New South Wales. The Liberal Party will go into a much needed period of opposition, which will hopefully last long enough for them to restructure and rethink the things that are important, not just policy-wise, not just philosophically-wise, but procedurally and candidate-wise. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. There's been a batch of recent opinion polls and all of them are suggesting a dip in the support for the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and a slight improvement of support for the opposition leader, Peter Dutton. And as a result, we've had the predictable headlines of the end of the honeymoon for Albanese. Now, there's a couple of issues to take into account here. On all the key indicators in polling, the Labor government is still way ahead, 58% to 42% in two-party preferred voting intentions. Albanese is the preferred Prime Minister by two to one over Peter Dutton. He's also got a net approval difference of 41 points against Peter Dutton. Now, most of this noise is media amplifying the things that they want the public to believe in, but we have to take into account that even if there is a slight drop in support for Albanese's personal rating, there is still a great deal of support for the Labor government. Now, this will start to wear off, especially coming into the second year of this government. New governments are generally given some slack, but this is the time that they really need to start performing. The honeymoon period is an easy time to bask. Now, I'll be fair, the government has achieved a lot in its time, and I don't think anyone will be surprised nor even disappointed to hear that it's a government that has improved the standing of Australia, both within and without. There's still a lot for it to do right. Now, it's nice to assume that whoever's involved isn't corrupt and incompetent, although, as we saw some of this is starting to sneak through with Michelle Rowland. An issue that seems to have blown over but shouldn't. I still think that the government needs to act on the Michelle Rowland thing. It, that's a stench that will haunt the government from now until it's properly resolved. I think, too, having its first real scandal that wasn't inherited and that wasn't the result of an inexperienced government finding its way and maybe prioritising things differently to how we as observers might like it, has helped in the end of this honeymoon period. But it means that the government can start to worry about getting things done or getting more things done and less about maintaining high poll. It still has exceptionally high polling. And Labor, unfortunately, has a reputation of panic. Kevin Rudd was dumped at 57% approval rating after he'd been at an unsustainable 72%. Kevin Rudd started really high, stayed really high, there were a whole range of factors and they decided they didn't want to work with him anymore. That's the risk, I guess, for uh, Anthony Albanese. The egos in the Labor Party will decide that they can do it better than he can and that, you know, another drop of poll down to 55%, which is still incredibly high for a prime minister, means that they have to get in someone else to keep the polls high, keep the polls high. 
Well, we might be a little bit of a distance away from that point, but we also said that about Kevin Rudd all those years ago. But all of this talk about a honeymoon in politics, I think it's all a little bit naff and it's all media-driven. And in reality, not many people like politicians that much. They just want them to do their job effectively. That's the most important thing. And when the media starts talking about the end of a honeymoon period, they make it sound like that's the end of a politician's career, but it's anything but. In real life, a honeymoon always ends. That's the nature of the honeymoon. And when it ends, that's when the relationship solidifies, usually. And there might be difficulties in that relationship, but the relationship continues, especially when they might look outside and see what else is on offer. But as always in politics, it's the issues of the day that affects the electoral standing of the government and how well they handle these issues. Now, the federal government has been cut a little bit of slack by the electorate over interest rates. And as we explained last week, interest rates are not the be-all and end-all of economic management. And it's not the massive issue that the media always makes it out to be. And generally, there will be a certain amount of goodwill towards either a new government or a government that just has been returned after an election victory. But the second year of a new government is the crunch time. So we've had a lot of that stuff about nine years of coalition government incompetence and look at the big mess that they've left behind now. Irrespective of all of this, governments have to be in office to fix problems, even if they didn't cause the problems in the first place. So this is a critical time for the Labor government. What it does during this year will define the rest of this parliamentary term and also determine the longevity of this Labor government. And if this year is managed well, that will be a good sign for its future political prospects. And bearing in mind that they won't be up against a serial underperformer like Peter Dutton forever, but mess up this year and they might be in office for a shorter period of time than they expected. One of the National Party leaders said politics, cock of the walk one day, feather duster the next. And it can happen that quickly. Generally, the public like to give you a go. The Labor government has a much better front bench too. Not everyone is a superstar, but not everybody can be. Just through the nature of being able to balance all the states, it's a federal government, so you do want representatives from all states. It's a Labor government, so you do want representatives from all factions. And in some cases, some of the people from some of these areas aren't going to be as good as maybe other people from the from different ones who couldn't get in because of numbers. I want Australians to enjoy a more secure nation with more secure industries and more secure jobs, to have a better future. The Liberals want the next 10 years to look like the last 10 years. Well, you can't deliver for people if you're just trying to divide the nation. In all its forms, our future security depends on engaging with the world and shaping change. That's what drives our government's ambition for Australia. Not division and fear and negativity, but optimism and purpose and urgency. Because as I said here at the National Press Club, just three days before polling day, unless we shape the future, the future will shape us. And I have no doubt that Australians can rise to this moment and make this decade and beyond our own. We have enormous advantages if we're prepared to seize the opportunities that are right there before us. My government is working every day to build greater security for the nation, in our economy and in people's daily lives by engaging in our region, by investing in our sovereignty, our self-reliance, our capacity to make things here again, by seizing the opportunities of renewable energy, by building an economy that embraces innovation and productivity, repays hard work and rewards initiative, and by strengthening the services people rely upon. This is a better and more secure future we are determined to deliver. A better future made right here in Australia. Thanks very much. And Anthony Albanese was at the National Press Club during the week and this is a tradition for the Prime Minister to commence the year at the Press Club outlining their agenda for the year and I think his address provided more of a direction for what the Labor government hopes to achieve and this is what you'd hope for. It's nine months into this term of government and time is starting to slip away and 
The journalists at the National Press Club were not so impressive. It seems like they were there mainly for the free feed. Most of the journalists asking questions seem to suggest, oh, well, we know that the mainstream media has lost its relevance, but we're going to keep asking you these stupid questions and try and catch you out instead of trying to get better at the job that we do, but that's their choice. But Albanese unveiled some new ideas, suggesting that the superannuation system is to be reformed and that what they're trying to do is claw back the $53 billion in superannuation concessions that are made to wealthy people. And these are through wealth creation schemes rather than retirement plans, which is the whole purpose of it. So, of course, this has to be scaled back. And especially when you consider that the overall pension system costs $55 billion, the Liberal Party has attacked Albanese for wanting to scale back these schemes, but the Liberal Party hates the idea of superannuation anyway, so it's not clear why they're opposing it except to score political points. But these are the types of programs that Labor has to reduce and make the system more equitable for people, and especially in the context of trying to bring down a government debt of $1 trillion. The Coalition's hatred of superannuation is totally ir- irrational in that they hate social welfare, so they hate pensions. They hate the notion of poor people and not having adequate superannuation or pensions gives you a bigger pool of poor people. So I don't get that either. Well, maybe they're just a party of hate. Yeah, maybe they're just a party of hate. It's better to hate everything and maybe something you hate will, will get fixed. There's problems with the superannuation system, some of which were brought in by the last government. It's going to be difficult for the government to find the difference between people who are genuinely putting every spare cent they have in super and building, amassing a large super because they want a comfortable retirement as opposed to people using it as a tax haven and a tax dodge. It's probably a very fine line. And I'm not defending wealthy people here, except to say that if you're wealthy and you've, there's no real problem with that, it's how you deal with it. That's the problem. I'm, you know, So it's a big job that the government's going to do and they've got to stop listening to the wrong people with advice. Sure, consult widely, but you've got to get rid of the vested interests. You've got to listen to the ACOS, the social security people. You've got to listen to the public service. You've got to listen to banks. Sure. You've got to listen to financial providers, sure, but not just them. And will they do that? Time will tell. On speaking of wealthy people, it also seems that Albanese and the Treasurer Jim Chalmers, they're preparing the political pathway to amend the Stage 3 tax cuts, and they keep referring to difficult economic circumstances and skirting the issue when they're asked about it. Now, we can't accept that the Stage 3 tax cuts will be repealed or amended until it actually does happen, so I think we just have to keep pointing out the absolute anomaly and unfairness of Stage 3 tax cuts, but based on the noises that the federal government is making about this, it appears that there will be some changes. We don't know what they will be. And another issue that has slipped through the cracks is a decision made by the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, and It was a very quiet announcement, almost as quiet as the decision to renew the contract for offshore immigration detention in Nauru. And she's given environmental approval for 116 coal seam gas wells in Queensland. And it's almost like she did just didn't want anyone to hear the news about this, but this doesn't stack up very well at all. Now, coal seam gas, it's also known as fracking, that's one of the most environmentally damaging forms of gas extraction. And maybe if you had just one or two, that might be safe, but 116. Now, these gas wells have been approved for Santos, and Santos has donated over $500,000 to the Labor Party since 2015 and $80,000 in the last financial year. And they do donate to the Liberal Party and the National Party as well. And this is the same issue that we discussed last week, David, donations in politics. And this is the sort of thing that happens. Corruption of the political system and corruption of the environment. Now, I realise that Labor is not the environmental party that it thinks that it is. It's trying to be pro-environment and pro-mining at the same time. And we're seeing that combining those two is not really possible. But if the Labor government is trying to convince the electorate about their Greens credentials and lowering greenhouse emissions, well, this is not the way to go about it. In fact, it's the worst possible way. And it's going to make for some very interesting discussions with the Australian Greens the next time the Labor government tries to get its legislation through the Senate. Mining and green isn't incompatible as such. There are sustainable mining practices, but there's not a lot of will for it with the mining companies in Australia. And yeah, Labor is stuck 
because there's a lot of miners who are Labor members. Uh, the big mining, the CFMEU, is a major part of the Labor Party, and the Labor Party is parliamentary representation for unions in Australia. This is not a conspiracy. This is not a bias. This is a historical fact. They keep bashing Labor over the head with it. It'd be like saying, oh, the Greens are in line with the environmental movement. Yes. <laughs> What's your problem here? <laughs> and they never say anything about it. It's why it's very disappointing when political leaders like Chris Minns in New South Wales try and distance themselves from unions, not corrupt unions, which have existed but are pretty rare, but just normal unions that the media are banging on about. So Labor has a, a balance between doing what's right for the environment and there are a lot of very pro-environment members of the Labor Party too. So they have to balance those members plus their union members. And of course, the way to do that would be to sit down and say, well, what should we mine in Australia? Has coal mining finished? Should we retrain a lot of these miners to move into more sustainable energy like solar energy and et cetera? Should we look at other things that are less damaging to the environment and mining that instead? And looking at practices that are less damaging to the environment and that are restorative to the environment. That would be a long process, which we may not have time for. So without defending Labor's stance here, I can understand where they're coming from. The Liberal Party don't have this issue. <laughs> the Liberal Party only have to balance the interests of their donors and members, most of whom are very much pro-mining and pro-coal mining as the National Party, which I'm not even sure that it has any policies relating to agriculture. Well, it seems like the main difference between the major parties is that when the Liberal Party's in government, well, these mines just automatically happen. So at least when the Labor government is in office, they consider these applications and then they approve them. So it seems like that's the main yeah, difference between right. the two major parties when they're in government. It takes a couple more days, but, you know. Pretty much the same thing. But, David, we started this section talking about honeymoons and, as we discussed last week, the real electoral test is coming up in the Melbourne seat of Aston and that's actually been decided that it will be held on April the 1st and the Liberal Party has chosen Rashina Campbell and essentially that's the choice of News Corporation and I expect that we'll see some very favourable coverage of Rashina Campbell in the Herald Sun and the Australian. The Liberal Party, as we discussed last week, they probably will win that seat but they've shunned two moderate candidates and they've chosen someone who doesn't actually live in the electorate but ticks all the boxes of Liberal Party conservatism but that's their choice and we can definitely say that we won't see the former member for Aston, Alan Tudge, on the campaign trail trying to shore up votes for the Liberal Party but there's a lot of things to read into the final result on April the 1st and I guess we'll get to see if the honeymoon period for the Labor government is coming to an end or continuing after April the 1st. I think the choice of Rashina Campbell was exactly the wrong one for the message that the party wants to give through. I think they've underestimated how much the party is still hated or the current party is still hated in Victoria. And so to bring in more of the same, to bring in another Morrison-esque right-wing dry liberal isn't going to help them at all. And also one who is affiliated with the News Corporation. It looks like that Melbourne might become the second city in the world to boycott all News Corp publications, first one being Liverpool in the UK. There's a lot of talk for it. There's a lot of disdain for News Corp. And even though her promotional materials may not mention her connection with News Corp, people will find out. So I can't call it at all, but I don't think it was the stroke of genius. I also get the sense and that if it goes to Labor, it'll stay in Labor a very long time uh, for a seat that was nominally a safe Liberal seat. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time. Thank you.